Dr. Subramaniam, I'd like to start by asking you what India's earliest reservations were with the IAEA. The IAEA was established following Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace plan. At that stage, there were two rival philosophies underlying IAEA. One was what India wanted, namely the IAEA should be the agency. Let me just interrupt you a second. In the script, we will explain what IAEA was and everything. So if you can just give me the Indian point of view, why you, why you had reservations, that yeah. would be great. Yes. Um, shall I? Yes. yes. Uh, our reservations were that we felt that the IAEA would be used as a regulatory agency and that to, in a discriminatory manner against the development of uh, peaceful applications of nuclear energy in Um, our reservations. Let me just ask again. What was what were India's earliest reservations with IAEA? We feared that it would be used as a regulatory agency, which would hamper the development of peaceful applications of nuclear energy in the developing countries. You mentioned a, a quote by Homi Baba, and I'd like to, if you could repeat that. Yes, Homi Baba said uh, about the pursuit clause of the IAEA that uh, it is like not only enslaving us, but enslaving our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, what are your recollections of India's defeat in the 1962 Himalayan clashes with China, and what were the consequences for the Indian military program? Well, the Indian military program was doubled. The budget was almost doubled overnight and India raised 10 new mountain divisions. And then we went in for purchase of equipment all over the world uh, in order to give ourselves adequate capability for defense against another such kind of attack. And at the same time, of course, it had a very shattering effect on India's morale, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. And therefore, when less than two years later, when the Chinese explosion, nuclear explosion came, well, it, uh, it uh, aggravated all the fears we had about China. What was your own reaction to that news of the test? Well, my reaction to that test was that India should go nuclear. And can you just expand on that? Well, I, th at that time, I argued for India exercising nuclear option, and I argued it was well within India's nuclear India's technological capability, and it was also well within our economic means. And uh, roughly these were arguments which were also at that time put forward by Dr. Baba. What prompted you to make those arguments? Well, I was working in the Ministry of Defense, and I was dealing with the equipment at that time. And if you can, you can, uh, I said short, but you can expand a lot, a lot more than that. Okay. Well, I was working in the Ministry of Defense and, um, and I was dealing with the equipment and I was also dealing with the intelligence at that stage. And uh, even then, I was one of the few exponents in the Ministry of Defense about uh, geostrategic approach to India's uh, security problems. And therefore, I felt that uh, India would be at a terrific disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, nuclear China and therefore that India should exercise its nuclear option. I'm going to repeat this a little bit. You know how this is. We edit and we go over things and try not to say as you said before. Just, I just want to repeat it. What was your role in the 1964-68 domestic debate concerning India's nuclear weapons policy and what were your arguments in favor? Well, in fact, till about 1968, I did not take part in the public debate because up to 1966, October, I was a civil servant within the Ministry of Defense and uh, then I went to the London School of Economics as a fellow in strategic studies and uh, the first paper I wrote was only in 1968 and that was a paper called uh, um, Credible Strategy to Face a Nuclear Adversary. And uh, in that paper, I had advocated that uh, 
India will have to move towards exercising nuclear option but probably we will not be able to do it in the 70s we may have to do it in the 80s but we should move in various directions so that we would have a balanced capability in the 80s. What were the factors that prompted you to come to that conclusion? First is I always felt that uh, India should f stand up to uh, nuclear China and secondly I found uh, the non-proliferation treaty made nuclear weapons a uh, legitimate currency of power in international relations and India as a large country in the world uh, should also have that legitimate currency of power and especially when so many nations of the world had uh, acceded to that treaty and had made it a legitimate currency of power even though we didn't approve of it. And uh, thirdly I felt that that was the only way in which India would be able to preserve its non-alignment and uh, face up to the pressures of the great powers in the world. What were the arguments in favour of an Indian bomb or an Indian nuclear weapons program? What did you feel were the arguments in favour? Well, first is, as I said, it, is, um, it's, uh, it was made a legitimate currency of power by the non-proliferation treaty. If it was good enough for five nations of the world, it should be good enough for India. And uh, secondly is uh, India is a country which had about one-sixth of global population living within its borders and uh, if India is to hold together it must have necessary uh, cohesion and uh, in that cohesion the national power and image of national power is an essential ingredient and uh, because the nuclear weapons have become international currency of power India needed that ingredient. How could India, a traditional advocate of disarmament, consider acquiring nuclear weapons at this stage? The two are not mutually contradictory. The question is, it's not what we want, but we have to take into account the belief systems of other nations of the world. And if the other nations of the world believed in nuclear deterrence, we have to operate on that belief system, irrespective of our own preferences. Our preference was for nuclear disarmament. While we should work for nuclear disarmament, at the same time, we have to also, if we want to influence others, have to operate on their belief system. And so long as the other powers in the world, and especially the industrialized nations, believed in nuclear deterrence, we have got to, first of all, acquire it. And thereafter, with that in our possession, we should have worked for uh, nuclear disarmament. What was your response to the arguments against an Indian nuclear weapons program? I'm talking about in the, si the late 60s. Most of those arguments were sentimental. They were not logical. Could you expand on that? Yes, most of these people who put forward those arguments argued on the basis nuclear weapons are evil. We should not therefore have it. It is too costly. We cannot afford it or uh, that uh, we are advocating disarmament and therefore it would contradict our, um, our stand on that. Those are the kinds of arguments which I put forward, which I do not think, if you really analyze it, had much substance to them. Let me just for the, the final time ask you to summarize um, what the arguments went, why you were in, in support. And you were in the Ministry of Defence at the time, you said. Yes, I so was in the Ministry could, of Defence. If you could start by saying I was in the Ministry of Defence and I felt for these reasons that um, we should go nuclear or whatever. I was in the Ministry of Defence, though I don't think I had much say in this matter because my position was uh, at a low middle level. Um, but I did argue this where the people who are my superiors and try to impress these considerations on them. Um, I felt that given a nuclear China to the north, a nuclear China with which we had a border problem and a nuclear China which was trying to intervene in India's internal affairs at that time, that we had no option but to go nuclear. Secondly, as I uh, as other countries of the world had made nuclear weapons a legitimate currency of power, India must also have them. 
1965, following the Kashmir War, Pakistan's Prime Minister, Bhutto at the time, said, if India builds the bomb, Pakistan would eat grass in order to get one of its own. How seriously did you take Pakistan's threat at that time? Well, to be very frank, we didn't take it very seriously at that time. Can you expand on that? Well, at that stage, we didn't think that the Pakistanis had the necessary capability to go nuclear for many, many years to come. And therefore, uh, I would say that we did not um, um, take Pakistan very seriously in the 60s. How much further along was India in her nuclear program at this time? At that time, I didn't know that. I only knew, knew it later, that Baba had started what was called subterranean nuclear explosion project, which was a project for testing a nuclear explosive device underground. Um, but in 1966, uh, Dr. Baba died, and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai took over. And I used to have arguments with Dr. Sarabhai because he was a post-India excising nuclear option. And uh, I presume that Tilda Sarabhai died uh, while the various experimental uh, physicists did pursue the research. Uh, there was no commitment to India uh, going in for a uh, nuclear explosion or a uh, nuclear device. Did you agree with um, the General, uh, General Galwa school of theory at this time that the more countries that had nuclear weapons, the safer the world would be? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I did subscribe to Galwa thesis, and in fact, I do subscribe to it even today, but he didn't say more without any reservations or limitations. Uh, his view was if there were about 15 countries in the world, it would, uh, it would result in a better balance, and I would agree with him. Uh, I don't think Galavad thesis meant uh, a proliferation to 100 nations or anything of that sort. How did India participate in the drafting of the NPT? Uh, we did not. Uh, we, we participated in all. How, did, how was India participating at this stage? Just, let's just wait a second. Okay. India participated very vigorously in the debate leading up to the NPT. Uh, Mr. V.C. Trivedi was uh, a very articulate exponent of uh, India's view. Uh, he argued that non-proliferation meant that those who are proliferating should stop proliferation, and those who have not started proliferating should not begin it. But once India found that this view was not being accepted by the proliferating powers, then India would have nothing to do with the non-proliferation treaty. Why did India decide not to sign the treaty? I think essentially it was a feeling that India was being discriminated against and the treaty was a treaty to catalyze the possession of nuclear weapons in the hands of the few and uh, to prevent the developing nations especially from having an equal status. It was hegemonic in nature. How did Mrs. Gandhi's views differ on the subject, on the nuclear subject, from her predecessors? Well, I don't know whether there was very um, major differences, because uh, Jawaharlal Nehru kept the option open, even though he was against nuclear weapons, but he did not close India's options. And I understand that there is a letter which he had written at one time to Dr. Baba, when Dr. Baba proposed India renounce the nuclear option, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had said that uh, we should be very careful about this. In the case of uh, Mr. Shastri, Mr. Shastri sanctioned the subterranean nuclear explosive project. Therefore, I don't think that there was any major differences of view in regard to approach to the nuclear uh, weapons uh, between Jawaharlal Nehru, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Indira Gandhi. All of them didn't want it, but at the same time they felt 
if the compulsions of the international situation and the international norms of conduct would compel them, then they would exercise the option if necessary. I'm going to ask you what were the benefits of retaining the option? If you could just go over that, what, what did they see as being the benefits at the time? I think the benefit uh, immediately perceived was that it would give India bargaining leverage and influence in negotiating disarmament. Secondly, it, uh, it would uh, enable India to exercise the option if India found over a period of time that uh, it, is, it was becoming more and more acceptable currency of power in international relations. How did India's security concerns change during the period that Mrs. Gandhi was in office? This is the first time, 66 to 77. How did things change? Well, it, we faced a major security crisis in 1971 when uh, the Pakistani military action in uh, Bengal exploded uh, in such terrific violence and there were 10 million refugees on pushed into our, onto our soil and uh, we had to face um, that situation uh, with the Pakistan supported tacitly by the United States administration and China and that was a very difficult period and that was the period in which in order to countervail that influence uh, India entered into a uh, friendship treaty with the Soviet Union which was a uh, countervailing measure at that stage. But at the same time, it drove home to India the point that uh, India was in a very difficult position facing a combination of powers like the United States, China, and Pakistan at that stage. Uh, therefore, we came through that crisis, even though I would say on the whole successfully, uh, but it did leave India with a considerable concern about its security for the future. Let me just ask you as a separate question, why did India sign a friendship treaty with the Soviet Union? What did she hope to gain from it? Well, it was meant to be a uh, countervailing influence against the United States going too far in its support to Pakistan. And it was proved in 1971, December. Uh, if you read uh, Dr. Kissinger's memoirs, uh, he himself says, the U.S. administration asked China to move against India and the Chinese asked the question, what happens if the Soviet Union moved against China? Uh, even though in the United States did give some guarantees to China about that contingency, China did not move. And therefore it was quite obvious that the Indian action of entering into a friendship treaty with Soviet Union did succeed in restraining China from acting in spite of all the goading it received from the United States. How did you interpret Nixon's decision to send the USS Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal? Well, it was uh, one of the instances of what is known as demonstration of use of force without war or coercive diplomacy. And it didn't succeed. But it didn't succeed partly because of the fact the Enterprise came about two days late. In your writing, I think you've also referred to it as atomic gunboat diplomacy. Would you, yes. would you mind repeating that? Yes, actually, when you send your task force with the... Let me just ask you the question again. How did you interpret <laughs> Nixon's decision to send the USS Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal during the 71 war? How did you interpret it? It was a piece of coercive diplomacy uh, when a um, vessel which is known to contain nuclear weapons was sent into the Bay of Bengal in an attempt to exercise intimidation on India. Let's just stop a second. What was that? What was that noise? Oh, you said watch. Oh, okay. I just heard a strange noise. Okay. Mm. Right. Let me just ask you again. What was your reaction to President Nixon's decision to send the USS? enterprise into the Bay of Bengal and was India also concerned China would intervene at that point? Um, was that as an additional question? So. 
uh, we were not very worried about China intervening at that point because um, the passes were covered with snow. <coughs> okay. Hmm. The, if I could just ask you about the USS Enterprise just one last time. Yeah. Why was it such a threat? It was a threat because if the Enterprise had come in close enough to the shores of uh, uh, Bangladesh, then they could have started flying in the aircraft to over Dhaka. In which case, it would have faced India with a problem whether the Indian Air Force should fire on the U.S. aircraft. What effect did this have on foreign policy? Well, uh, it would have stymied completely the liberation of Bangladesh. What was your reaction to the news that India had successfully carried out a peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974? My reaction was, at last, the people have done it. They have acted sensibly. Excuse me. Asking you what your... It was interpreted. No, no, we have to wait a minute. No, you go. Keep going. Yeah. Just for one second. All right. It is interpreted there as atomic gunboat di diplomacy. And, uh, right, let's, let's just say it one more time and why yes. it was interpreted as uh, It was interpreted as atomic gunboat diplomacy Sorry. because... Let's just, if you can look at me and yeah. look at the camera, yes. that'd be great. Uh, it was interpreted as atomic gunboat diplomacy because it was very well known that uh, Enterprise had nuclear weapons on board. ask you again, um, or at least about the peaceful nuclear explosion, could you explain the timing of the test? There was nothing um, extraordinary about the timing of the test, though a lot of stories had been written about it. It all depends upon when the decision was taken to make the test. That I understand was sometime in October 1972. At that time, Indira Gandhi did not face any crises. She was at the height of her popularity when she took that decision. And uh, once that decision was taken, uh, the test came 18 months later, which was the, in, in, uh, the normal period for development of the explosive device. Wipe your face just a little bit. Um, can you give me an idea of the factors you think which influenced her to make the decision in 72? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because I, I understand Mrs. Gandhi had not um, uh, prepared any papers on the subject, uh, nor are there any other papers uh, prepared by any of her advisors on it. But I have a feeling Mrs. Gandhi perhaps wanted to do it before the first uh, NPT review conference and uh, perhaps she wanted to do it in order to show that uh, India should no longer be treated as, uh, as a non-nuclear weapon power for all time to come. And also that she, at that time, uh, there was uh, considerable speculation about the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And uh, the United States and Soviet Union had conducted a number of tests and therefore she thought that uh, this would be the appropriate time to go along with the exploitation of their technology. What do you think India gained from that test? Uh, India gained a reputation of having uh, the necessary technology to assemble a nuclear explosive device at short notice. Okay, if you could just make your answers just a little bit longer. Um, let me just ask you again, what do you think India gained from that explosion? India gained a reputation of uh, power which is in a position to go nuclear at short notice. Uh, secondly, of course, it was a technological feat for a developing country. And uh, thirdly, I think it did put up India's reputation among the developing countries of the world. Let's just do that one more time, if you can just bring it all together. Could you summarize for me what India gained from the PNE? Uh, first is uh, the reputation that India had achieved a particular stage in the nuclear energy development. 
The secondly, that India was in a position to transform her peaceful nuclear application to military application at a very short notice. And thirdly, that uh, uh, the uh, enhancement in international reputation. After the, the PNE, Pakistan suggest, uh, proposed a, a nuclear weapons free zone for, for South Asia. Why was this so unacceptable to India? Because we do not believe, just as it is not possible for somebody to spray a field in the middle of a whole lot of fields, only one field with a spray. If you want to um, get rid of pests, you will have to spray the whole area with the pesticide. Therefore, we believe that these kinds of regional nuclear weapon free zones are placebos and they do not really um, uh, lead to denuclearization of the world. We can only have one nuclear weapon free zone in the world that is a nuclear weapon zone free zone for the whole globe. This is because of China, right? This is, this it is, is not only because of China, but it is also a question of legitimizing nuclear weapons by uh, saying that you want a particular area free of them and asking the nuclear weapon powers to give you guarantees, you are legitimizing the nuclear weapons. But earlier, India had supported the treaty to Lataleko and, and also African nuclear weapons free. Yes, uh, those were things in which we said that so long as some people wanted to have some local arrangement and all of them were agreeable on that, well, we don't have to object to that. How do you account for the surge of interest in the early 70s in America um, for this non-proliferation issue? How do you account for it? The non-proliferation issue was uh, raised in America in order to hide the ongoing arms race. It was uh, an attempt at diverting attention. Uh, both the countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, were galloping with a proliferation. Since they were going ahead with the proliferation, the non-proliferation was kept at the front of the people in order to hide the ugly fact of galloping proliferation of weapons. And was India a particular target in this sense? I don't think India by itself is a target. But I think on the whole, the, uh, it was an attempt at uh, diverting attention at uh, the proliferation which uh, followed the non-proliferation treaty. How did you view President Carter's non-proliferation efforts? I don't think he was very serious about it. Did you agree with his views that a country could be prevented from building a bomb by denying it technical assistance? Well, uh, he had been proved wrong. In which case? Well, uh, I don't think that uh, the Pakistanis went ahead and have built a bomb without technical assistance from somebody else. I mean, they may have taken it away, but uh, nobody gave it to them willingly. Uh, uh, India did it. China did it. This is like the old story of, uh, you know, the gods felt that if they hid fire away from humanity, the human beings will not get it. Prometheus had to steal the fire. Uh, the same old idiotic attitude continues. What was your reaction to the news in the late 70s that Pakistan was in embarking on an enrichment program? Did you take it very seriously? Well, I did take it very seriously because at that time I was the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee which produced the report on Pakistani nuclear efforts. And what did you find out? Well, we found that they, had, they were going on a very purposive uh, effort to go in for enrichment to reach nuclear capability. And in that respect, they were following partly the uh, Israeli model and partly the Chinese model. What kind of contribution do you think Dr. A.Q. Khan has made, Ooh, made at this time? Very significant contribution. I would say his contribution perhaps is the most important contribution. Can you elaborate on that at the time in your findings? What do you? At the time we knew that uh, Dr. A.Q. Khan had come from Holland 
and I had uh, set up the Project 706, and um, uh, he had uh, um, brought with him the centrifuge technology, and he had set up the centrifuges under Project 706 uh, in um, Kahuta. And therefore, it was quite obvious that uh, Dr. Yeki Khan was the most important contributor to Pakistani nuclear capability. And what was the significance of the fact that they, have, um, they acquired this centrifuge technology? What, what does that mean? Well, it, it meant a lot of confidence on the part of Pakistanis that they would be able to manage such uh, sophisticated technology. And secondly, of course, it was a surprise to the rest of the world that uh, people felt that centrifuge was such a sophisticated technology no developing nation would attempt it. So with the result, when in the original Zanger's trigger list, the centrifuge technology did not even feature. And with the result, Zanger even cleared uh, one of the Swiss companies to put in all the piping and plumbing <laughs> for the plant in Pakistan. How did you think India should respond to this? Well, my view is that... Uh, at, the, at the time, how did you think? At that time, I felt that India should keep a careful watch on Pakistani developments, and uh, if uh, Pakistan was close to going nuclear, India also should uh, exercise its weapon option. If we can just go over a little bit of that, what evidence was there for an Islamic bomb? I don't think there was any evidence for an Islamic bomb. That was only a name given to it by Mr. Bhutto. Uh, and uh, it was a catchy thing. And possibly Mr. Bhutto, with a very fertile imagination, felt that was one way of getting money from various Islamic countries. What was your reaction to President Carter's decision to renew aid to Pakistan following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, despite this growing um, evidence that Pakistan was embarking on a, a program? Well, we always felt that um, the anti-Sovietism in American policy, um, uh, in fact, was more fervent than Pakistan's, uh, than, than the U.S. Let's loyalty let's to... Let's start it again. I'm yeah. sorry. What was your reaction to Carter's decision on this question of military assistance? It only confirmed us in our view that the anti-Sovietism in the U.S. policy was more fervent than the non-proliferation objectives. Is there anything else you'd like to add about that? Well, we've, we felt that in any case, the United States has turned a blind eye to Israel in reaching its nuclear capability, and I, that perhaps they would do the same thing in regard to Pakistan. President Carter had made non-proliferation a key issue in his campaign. Um, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, he renewed aid to, to Pakistan in spite of the growing evidence how did, what did this say about American non-proliferation policy from, from your point of view? I don't think that uh, in India we took uh, the U.S. non-proliferation policy very seriously. It is uh, to use one of uh, Mr. V.C. Trivedi's um, comparisons earlier, it was like the drunken emperor who decreed prohibition for all his subjects. Um, here is the United States with sitting on 25,000 warheads and continuing with uh, producing more warheads and continuing with uh, more and more producing more and more weapons and uh, not willing in to enter into serious uh, negotiations on test ban treaty uh, or in any way cutting off uh, the further proliferation of nuclear weapons and uh, introducing nuclear weapons into the oceans of the world, all over the world, including in the Indian Ocean, uh, we didn't take that the uh, United States was serious about its non-proliferation objectives. That was one of those things which you say during election times.
What was your reaction to the 1981 attack on the Ozirak reactor? That was almost like snatching something from a child's hands. The Azirak could not have produced any weapon for Israeli, for Iraqis for another 15 years. And uh, this is again one of those things which showed that uh, the United States was prepared to condone any action on the part of Israel. We just go over that. There was some traffic noise on it. <laughs> How did you interpret the um, the Ozirak incident? The Ozirak incident was uh, almost like a case of taking away a toy from the hands of a child. I don't think there was any real danger of Israelis, uh, Iraqis producing a bomb for the next 15 years. And uh, it was more or less on the, on the part of Israelis a warning to all Arab countries that if they, anybody started a, anything in nuclear realm, they would hit. And of course, it was endorsed by all their supporters in the West. Can I ask you, what are India's current security concerns? Our security concerns are to shield our country's decision-making process, our nation-state building process, nation consolidation process from the turbulence we have around India and prevent others from intervening in uh, these nation-building and nation-consolidation process. And also to ensure that we are not subjected to coercive diplomacy by the major powers of the world. What is that turbulence that you... Oh, just a second. Children. Just elaborate yeah. on. Uh, there is turbulence all over the developing world, just as there was in the three centuries preceding the Second World War in, the, in that part of the world which constitute today the industrialized states. And this turbulence is... Uh, inevitable outcome of the nation-state building process. And uh, that turbulence we have all around us. And we have it inside India too. But at the same time, if we are to uh, pursue our nation-state building process, we have to shield ourselves from the turbulence around us. To what extent do you think India's current nuclear and space capabilities provide an effective deterrent against China and Pakistan? At the present moment, they don't provide any uh, deterrent capability. They have only a potential deterrent value because at the present moment, they are still technology pursuits. They are not yet weapons. Do you think the, the, the potentiality is enough in itself? Yeah. Uh, well, up to a point, you can say that vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, but you can't say that vis-a-vis -vis China, which has got already weapons. How do you think an Indian bomb could act as an effective deterrent? Well, it could act as a deterrent in a situation of asymmetry where the other side has got the bomb and it can always threaten to use that bomb. And uh, therefore, it acts as a deterrent against threat of use of the bomb. Do you think India will sign MPT in the nearest future? I can't think of India. I can't think of India signing NPT unless we have got uh, a, a change in political leadership, which is totally not in tune with the Indian thinking. What do you think uh, India's response would be if the Pakistanis do go ahead with a nuclear test? I don't think they would. I think uh, they would adopt the policy like the Israelis of developing an arsenal without testing it. You mean Pakistan would do that? Yes. Yeah. And just a general question about the space program. I just wondered um, to what extent it's been defense related. Could you comment on that? No, it is not very much defense related because our space scientists have tried to keep it jealously peaceful. Um, we have a separate missile program under the Defence Ministry. 
how effective has the U.S. been in its efforts to control proliferation, do you think? That's a laugh. I don't think the U.S. has ever done anything to control proliferation. They have only contributed to proliferation all around the world, whether it is Israeli or Pakistan, or in their own proliferation of their own weapons. Anything else you'd like to add about that? Well, all that I would say is that I don't think that the United States has, has ever had a policy against proliferation. They always had a policy uh, which consisted of license to proliferate for themselves and their allies and trying to impose hegemony and stopping the proliferation of the rest of the world. That is basically an unrealistic and unrealizable policy. If I can just ask you to comment specifically on Israel and South Africa in that sense, that would be very helpful. Okay. In what way do you think the U.S. has contributed in the Israeli and South African example? Okay. Yeah, it's on. In the case of Israel... Uh, if you can just keep your eyes on me. Yes. In the case of Israel, according to the evidence given by a former deputy director of CIA for technology called Duckett, uh, the Americans were aware of Israel having diverted weapon-grade uh, fissile material from Numec facility, Apollo, Pennsylvania, as early as 1968, even before this okay, treaty was let signed. Me stop you, because we'll get into all that. We're doing that in the script, so I'll, I won't repeat that. But that's, yeah. the most, that's the evidence you want. Yes. Okay, that's fine. I can just ask you, how do you envision the next 10 years of the nuclear age? The next 10 years I envisage um, there can be two totally diametrically opposite developments. One is the number of nuclear weapon nations can increase, but not rapidly. It could include Pakistan, India, possibly Argentina, Brazil. That's about all. The other development could be that uh, there could be reduction in nuclear weapons and we could move towards elimination of nuclear weapons as has been envisaged by people who believe nuclear weapons can be eliminated. If we move on that path, then there is a possibility that you would be able to also stop proliferation. But the greatest impediment to that is the government of the United States. Because they believe that there is no way of eliminating nuclear weapons from the world. And once they accept that there is no way of eliminating nuclear weapons from the world, then it follows, it is inevitable, that more countries will have them. And finally, it will fall into the hands of the terrorists. How about the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union, at least on record, whether they really believe in it or not, we don't know, but it is on record that they want to eliminate nuclear weapons. As the other day in a conference in Moscow, an American scientist said, let us not test nuclear weapons, let us test Michael Gorbachev. Whether he's serious about this. Therefore, that is what one should do, but that is not what the United States is doing. If I can just ask you finally, what, what do you think motivates a country to want nuclear weapons? I think every country has gone for nuclear weapons uh, mainly for ensuring its security. Um, excepting perhaps uh, France and uh, lesser extent Britain where uh, it was done for purposes of prestige. All right, now if we can just stop there, thank you. That India could not face China unless this asymmetry between a nuclear China and a non-nuclear India was redressed. Secondly, the nuclear weapons were becoming a legitimate currency of power under the non-proliferation treaty. And therefore, India, representing one-sixth of mankind, should also have this currency of power. 
if it is to um, if it is to um, exercise its due influence in international relations. That's great. Let's just say it one more time because I kept hearing this awful noise outside, <laughs> and I think if you just wipe your face just <laughs> one last time, I'm sorry about this. Um, just one more time, if you can explain why you advocated an Indian nuclear program at this in the 60s after. Oh. Oh. Saying I felt that and it would, okay. Um, I felt that with China having gone nuclear, India would not be able to face up to China unless this asymmetry between Chinese capability and Indian capability was redressed. Secondly, since the nuclear weapons were becoming legitimate currency of power under the non-proliferation treaty, India with one sixth of the global population within its borders uh, should also have that currency of power if it were to exercise its due influence in international relations. How did people respond to your views? Well, if I may say so, uh, most of the people uh, when we did not tune in to these arguments. For them, it is a question of China has gone nuclear, we should go nuclear. Pakistan has gone nuclear, India should go nuclear. Uh, they were not thinking in terms of the sophistication of international relations and the role of uh, power in international relations and role of force in international relations. And then one last time, um, the time of the, when the USS Enterprise was sent into the Bay of Bengal again, how did you view it? I, we viewed it as a, an attempt at coercive diplomacy, an old-fashioned type of gunboat diplomacy, this time atomic gunboat diplomacy because uh, the enterprise is rep was reported to have nuclear weapons on board. Okay, what, just again on the pro-bomb, the earlier period, um, let me just ask you again, how do your views, and how did your views in the 60s as you've described them, um, how were they consistent with the, the traditional Indian sort of views on disarmament and, and I'm thinking of the Mahatma Gandhi principles and nonviolence and so on. How are they compatible? How were they compatible? Mahatma Gandhi himself has explained why, while he had solved the problem of use of nonviolence in an offensive mode, he had not solved the problem of non-violence in defensive mode. Now, in this particular case, working for nuclear disarmament uh, required the credibility of somebody having the nuclear weapons to disarm. The words of countries which did not have the nuclear weapons did not count in the international forum of disarmament. It's only when you had something to disarm you were heard in the forum. And it is therefore necessary, if you are really wanting to pursue the goal of disarmament, you will have to show something to disarm. So can you just summarize what your views are today on the subject of nuclear proliferation? Uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of nuclear, nuclear proliferation? Yes. Um, I, I think that it could take one of the two alternative paths. The one is that there could be further proliferation, but it will not be as rapid as uh, many people predict. It may be Pakistan, India, Argentina and Brazil may join the present six nuclear weapon nations or seven nuclear weapon nations and that would be about 11. The other possibility is that uh, the world can move towards reduction in nuclear arsenals, reduction in nuclear stockpiles, uh, more and more of uh, control over uh, new armaments including uh, putting weapons in space and uh, uh, with a declared objective of ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons. If you do that, that there is a possibility you can slow down the nuclear proliferation, and uh, this may not come about. Which countries do you consider today have the bomb? 
the five declared nuclear weapon powers, Israel and Pakistan. You mean actually have the bomb physically or do you, the capability? Yes. You consider Pakistan has the, the bomb? Yes, I consider Pakistan has could, the bomb. Could you just elaborate on that? Well, I am, I am one of those people who have a lot of respect for the Pakistani scientists. I do not think that they have worked now for 10 years and I do not think that they have been able to get the fissile materials from 1982-83 onwards and still that they have not assembled the bomb so far. The fact that they have tested the triggering device uh, a year ago would show that they are very close to it. Whether there are only two screwdriver turns away or they have already turned those screwdrivers, I think that's purely academic. I think the implications are of a Pakistani bomb, or would be, no, are, you'd say, for the South Asia? Well, um, it may bring about a, a stable, deterrent, mutually deterrent relationship between India and Pakistan, as it has happened in Central Europe, as it has happened between China and Soviet Union. Um, I think that is more likely than it's contributing to increased tension because both sides would now fear of uh, taking any action which would contribute to escalation.